some of the limitations of the deep learning systems that we have all around us. A human child or, or infant is really driven by motivations to explore the world around it, to build models of the world around it, to learn how to control it, and you know, generally make progress in understanding and control of the world around it. So it's a very much more active learning process. And um, this basically has inspired for the last two decades a small community of people interested in what we call developmental AI or developmental robotics. Robotics more when this is also realized in, in physical robots. And developmental AI is the sort of the more recent term where we try to do all of this exclusively in, in simulation. Now, this has a long history, of course. Even in Turing's writings, you find this quote here, instead of trying to produce a program to simulate the adult mind, why not rather try to produce one which simulates the child's and have yeah, machines learn like children? So I think there are two really important reasons why this is very interesting and promising. And the first one is that this human cognitive development is really the only process we know that leads to human-like intelligence and consciousness. And second, the ability to interact, right, as this child is exploring its world with its body, interacting with objects, with the social environment, the ability to interact may in fact be critical for learning a causal understanding of the world. So many of you are scientists and you know, right, you, you do for a living, you do experiments. Why do you do experiments? Well, to often unravel the causal mechanisms of a complex system by intervening here and seeing to what changes in the, in the outcome this leads. So I think if we want to build AI systems that you know, reach human levels of understanding of the world, they have to be interactive so they can uh, start to probe the causal mechanisms of the world in an efficient fashion. And if any of this sounds interesting, I, I also want to put in a little plug here. Uh, I'm, I'm organizing with colleagues this Developing Minds global online lecture series where both people from psychology and machine learning and robotics and neuroscience come in to uh, give their perspectives on, on this range of issues. Uh, and the next talk is actually this Thursday, if you're interested. Now, um, I want to now give you a snippet of, of research that we do in one particular domain area, which, which is how to learn about objects and, and categories of objects and how to recognize them. So how do infants and toddlers actually learn about objects? Well, they require barely any labeling, but they actively explore objects. They take them in their hands, manipulate them, or move with their body around objects to see them from many perspectives. And that gives them both access to temporal structure, so time is very important here, and active control over the input. So rather than right, having a big database and sampling IID samples from it and then trying to learn from that, it's really extended interactions with individual objects that you know or are able to manipulate. So how can we um, use this in machine learning? Well, first, let's see what do we know from neuroscience about how this temporal structure is being utilized when learning about objects. Um, there's a classic experiment already from the 1980s by Miyashita who showed these kinds of fractal-like stimuli to monkeys um, and he had like a hundred of them or so, but he showed them always in the same order and he observed that after a while, if you looked at the responses of neurons in the object recognition area of the monkey's brain to these objects, that even objects that were looking very dissimilar ended up being represented very similarly if they were just neighbors in the sequence and the closer they were in this sequence, the higher the correlation of the neuronal responses to these different objects. So this has been known for a long time, and therefore it has been also used in computational models 
in neuroscience of, of how we learn about objects. And what we've done recently is we've been trying to combine this with some modern ideas from machine learning. So when we think about learning um, in an unsupervised fashion about objects, there's this whole um, subset of sort of machine learning called self-supervised learning. Um, and a particular flavor of this are so-called contrastive learning approaches. And how this roughly works is that you take an image and then you apply all sorts of manipulations to the image. You rotate it, you flip it, you change the colors around, something like that. And what you've done is you've changed the image drastically at the pixel level, but it's still the same semantics, right? We're still looking at this kind of uh, monkey here. So what you ask the learning system to do is to, to make those two versions or the, the representations of those two images similar. These are sometimes called a positive pair. But then you make them dissimilar from just random other samples from your big data set, random things that you, that you experience in the past. So, and then uh, you can use all sorts of image manipulations for this very important are like cropping apart and then resizing it and flipping and people have experimented with lots of things. And our idea was maybe we can sort of get rid of all these artificial image manipulations. This is clearly not what's going on in the brain. But instead, use the temporal structure. Simulate sort of these extended experience of interacting with objects, and then basically use the same kinds of algorithms where we make successive views that come out of such an interaction sequence and ask the learning system to make those similar while again making things dissimilar from lots of other things that you see, which is basically required to make sure that the whole representation is not collapsing onto a single point. And there are many different ways you can do this. So this um, we call contrastive learning through time. So this is a, a self-supervised deep learning framework that exploits the temporal structure and it mimics this continuous unsegmented stream of object views. There are no labels involved. And we do all this in simulation. We have a, a, a graphics engine 3D world that gives you uh, semi-photorealistic renderings. And then we basically generate such sequences of views. And the learning system will just make successive views similar, no matter what it finds there. Um, and so there's one important parameter here that is sort of how many successive views will really show the same object. And right? that's sort of a, a parameter of the approach. But we're not really distinguishing between these intra-object transitions uh, versus inter-object transitions. This, this algorithm doesn't make use of that information. So that's why it's fully unsupervised. And that's also what distinguishes it from, from some previous work. Now you can tell that the, the graduate students doing that work, they don't have children themselves. I wouldn't have my children play with scissors and hammers. But, well, you know, they, they will learn about this. Um, so here's what this looks like concretely, uh, another sort of visualization uh, to maybe drive home more precisely how the algorithm works. You have an encoding network. So this is a deep neural network, maybe some ResNet 18 or so. Image goes in, and um, this is projected to some, say, 128-dimensional embedding space. Here, I show a 2D caricature of this embedding space. Uh, and now we have sequences of images. Uh, here are two successive views of a, of a bunny, and here sort of lots of other things that you might sample in a long batch of data. And then what you basically do is you make these two successive representations move closer to each other while you move them away from other things um, that you have in your, in your data set. Um, and just for, but to, to be a little bit technical, so you, you basically use an adaptation of the kind of standard loss that is used also in algorithms like SimCLR, uh, if you're familiar with that. So there's, there's a term here. This corresponds to bringing the successors closer together. 
and the denominator here corresponds to moving things away from everything else in some batch of data that, that you have. Good, so, um, and then when you want to test the quality of the representation that is being learned, we use a, a standard linear classification paradigm. So once the representation is learned, so this embedding network stays fixed, we just train a linear classifier um, to, to make a um, yeah, decision to either identify a particular object or recognize objects from a particular category or something like that. So in our, on our very first um, approach already uh, some time ago, we tested this on different data sets, uh, the 3D world data set that I mentioned, then reproducing these biological experiments and then to not only have simulated images, we also used this old uh, computer vision database that uh, Joachim worked with in his youth, <laughs> which tells you um, that it's... <laughs> <laughs> it has seen many years. Um, we found it still useful. And um, this is just to show you that as a function of this parameter and fix, like how many objects, uh, how, how many frames in this section are really showing the same object, um, you can actually get perfect performance approaching this supervised version, at least for some of the self-supervised learning algorithms um, that we combined this with because, I mean, these are also very simple data sets by, by today's standards. Um, and if you look at the representation being learned and visualize it with the dimensionality reduction technique, so this PECMAC techniques, technique that we're using here is, is a little bit like t if you're more familiar with that, sort of an improved version of that, you see that the individual objects here form sort of nice clusters for the most part, and that's why also you can get very high accuracy on, on recognition with this. But again, this was just a proof of concept. Um, and another thing in this proof of concept is showing that, yeah, we get this sort of similar kind of effect that you see in the biological data, that if I start now showing object in a systematic order to the system, then things that are seen in succession, it will also represent similarly and this actually nicely matches the kind of curves that you, that you see in biology. And of course, that works for all the data sets. So whatever is close in time through this mechanism obviously will align in this latent representation space. Now, how can we scale this up? So the next thing we did is we wanted a sort of more natural infant habitat, habitat um, where uh, Arthur Aubrey, a postdoc in the lab, created this virtual apartment in which we were sort of then uh, rendering scenes with objects in with you know, complex um, backgrounds behind the objects to make the task a lot more harder. So concretely, we used uh, 3,000 um, objects from a big database and the agent is playing with these objects. So we're simulating these interactions in this virtual world uh, across three different time scales. So you, the agent makes little saccades to look at different locations around the object, rotates the objects, uh, turns to play with a new object and then changes place in the apartment and goes to a different place in the apartment to play with new objects. Um, and now this is a much harder task and um, one thing we were very interested in is also incorporating sort of other features that we know of about infant vision, in particular that they have a limited depth of field, so not everything is equally in focus, that there's a thing called foveation, we sample the center of the field of view with high resolution and the periphery we only perceive very uh, crudely, then infants manipulating objects since they have very short arms, it's well known that they actually hold those objects fairly close to their face, so they right, fill up a whole, a big portion of their visual space. And you can sort of combine all this, and then you get images like this from which the system learns in the end. And here I just show one example of how now the average object recognition accuracy on some test set of 80 objects is evolving as a function of training experience, 
for a baseline system contrastive learning through time as I described it previously and with these different modifications here and you see that these things they do have a positive impact but the system is still very far from you know being able to identify all the objects uh, correctly the reason um, in our opinion being that really the background clutter is actually causing a lot of problem in this fully unsupervised learning approach um, because if you think about the agent sitting here and then rotating this object, moving it about or so, um, what the learning mechanism wants to see, it wants to identify stable features in the environment, right? Things that happen close in time are moved together. And of course, the background objects, whether you, it, even if it's just you know, what you see sort of rudimentarily here, is actually perfectly stable. So the the representation, the algorithm latches onto those stable things in the background, and that is sort of still um, a problem for, for this approach. Um, now, another question you might ask is, okay, good, so this is sort of more um, biologically inspired, maybe, um, but it doesn't seem to work that well. What happens if you actually combine it with the standard kind of image augmentations that are used in contrastive learning, uh, like the ones that I've shown you before. Um, so here is where we do exactly this. We combine this temporal augmentations from these kinds of sequences with these, what we call baseline augmentations that are used in contrastive self-supervised learning. And basically we distinguish three classes of algorithms here. The, temporal one that I showed you so far, the baseline machine learning with these image augmentations or the combination. That's the TT plus algorithms. And to make a fair comparison, of course, we, we test them all on the same databases and we used four different data sets here, the virtual home environment that I talked about, but also some uh, published libraries where people manipulate objects, so we have, where we have videos of object manipulations. And we can now test this with different kinds of algorithms on the different data sets. And to, to cut a long story short, we see um, quite some good performance improvements by combining the temporal augmentations with the standard augmentations uh, over just using either of the two. And this is consistent across different algorithms, the Sims Clear, the Biol, the VicRec are all different self-supervised learning algorithms um, that you sort of combine with this or that we combined with this temporal augmentation idea. So pretty good improvements across the board here. Now, if you listen carefully to my introduction, I mentioned, right, the importance of active control, uh, but the system is in fact still learning passively, it's just learning passively from videos. It doesn't really, uh, it, it uses the temporal relationship in these interactions, but it doesn't use any other information about these interactions. So the next thing for us was to look at uh, really yeah, distilling the benefit of, of active control. and. In order to explain this, I want to make this distinction here between invariant representations that um, yeah, should look the same if the view changes versus equivariant representations where you really want, if the view changes like here, the representation should reflect how the view changes. Okay. And arguably, if you keep track of that information, well, you might actually learn a more powerful model that maybe starts to understand more about the 3D structure of objects. So how can we do this? Um, Cha Chu, a very talented student in the lab, came up with a method that he called CYPER for contrastive invariant and predictive equivariant representation learning. And I'm sort of explaining here how this works. Basically, 
uh, on, with an example of these standard image augmentations. So you have, a, you have an image, you apply augmentations like a crop and resize, and another crop and resize, and a flip, and a color change. And, but this could also be now two separate time points or so where you observe the object. And now you uh, have an encoder network uh, with shared weights, so we have two copies of this encoder network, and then we train one projection head to basically uh, move together these um, positive pairs, so have the representations of those two be similar, so this um, projection head will try to yeah, learn an encoder that will treat those as the same, and, but there's another prediction head that will, given two views, two such views of an image, will try to actually predict what were the transformations being applied. So, in sort of, if you are more of a robotics person, you would call this an inverse model. You know? What action did I need to take to get from this situation to that situation? Um, and in the end, after all this is trained, we only keep the encoder network, the projection heads are, are thrown away, and then you train uh, on some downstream task uh, with this representation here. And this works um, really well. I'm not gonna, for time reasons, show you many results, but one of the things I found very striking about this is that the representation that is being learned, again now uh, projected in two dimensions with this pack map method that I mentioned, it, actually gives you a, an organized representation of the objects that um, on the one hand has the identity represented, these are the different colors here, but then there's this substructure emerging that actually tells you what is the particular viewpoint with which I'm seeing this object. And you have this with the Cyper, but you don't have this uh, in, the, in the standard time augmented um, representation learning case. So, um, with that, I'm actually already at the end. I think I saved some time by not putting a conclusion slide in there. No, I must have <laughs> cut it out accidentally. So let me just wrap up uh, in, in my own words. I do think that learning in an interactive fashion is a very interesting but also challenging topic that I think might be a key to developing AIs that really understand the world in any sort of meaningful sense rather than you know, mimicking statistics uh, of what humans are doing. Um, and this can be done when we now have all the compute to investigate such questions uh, in simulated worlds but also with large video data sets. And I think this will be a very um, exciting topic for uh, the next future years. And with that, I'd like to acknowledge the people who did the work in particular, uh, Felix Schneider here, Markus Ernst, and uh, Zheng Yangju Chia Chu, who uh, came up with this contrastive learning through time, and Arthur Aubrey, a postdoc in the lab, who followed up with a lot of this work. And uh, finally, thank you all for your attention and also thank you to the funding agencies who've been supporting us.